And now we're going to be able to sit back and enjoy a few minutes of inspiration from our guest of honour. I had the privilege of teaching Laura A-level English and seeing her go on to read English at Cambridge, where she excelled in her studies and on the stage as an actor. Ever feisty, creative and original, she memorably came to see me to float her idea of a project to give a voice to thousands of women who have been marginalised or denigrated simply for being women. Her fearless denunciation of sexism has changed so many lives and empowered young women to girl up in the face of those who would exploit, despise or objectify them. Her courage, insight and determination have won her many accolades, including recognition from the Queen and a host of awards. I'm enormously proud of this brave young woman who is the best role model in the world for our pupils. Lady Edmund Lorbin. so much. What an incredible evening and what better metaphor for the Francis Holland Valleys we celebrate tonight than a combination of amazing grace and a fight song. Um, good evening my lords, ladies and gentlemen and in particular Francis Holland girls. What an incredible privilege for me tonight to speak to a group of such incredibly inspiring young women, particularly after seeing your skills and talents so fabulously displayed on the stage. I'd like to tell you, girls, three secrets. But first, let me explain how I came to know them. In 2012, I started a very small website to encourage people to share their experiences of gender inequality. The project grew out of my own frustration and was a small, unfunded venture. I thought that perhaps 50 or 60 people might share their stories and intended it simply to be an awareness-raising device. Instead, in three years, over 100,000 people added their testimonies. Women from as far afield as India, Peru and Brazil spoke out about their experiences and started to stand up against inequality. Many wrote that they'd reported a rape or assault for the first time after the project made them feel that they weren't alone and that it wasn't their fault. Men who read the project website told me that it had opened their eyes and changed their behaviour. Girls wrote to tell me that it had helped them to start feminist societies and stand up to sexism at school. And people all over the world started writing to tell me the little ways the project had inspired them to start standing up to inequality. Often they were very personal, unique actions which made me realise that making a difference doesn't always mean waving a banner or going on a march. There was a single mum who was sick of cold callers ringing and asking to speak to the man of the house, so she started putting them on to her six-year-old son. <laughs> there was a young girl who was constantly told by the boys in her class that girls are rubbish at science, and that's why she was the only girl in the class. Eventually, very calmly, she told them, actually, 13 people isn't enough to be a statistically significant sample. Some scientists, you are. <laughs> There was a man who saw two builders shouting at a woman, telling, them to sh telling her to show them her breasts. So he lifted up his t-shirt and showed them his instead. There was a young woman who was so tired of men pointing out her large breasts to her in the street and shouting at her about them, that she started responding by looking down and screaming like she'd never seen them before. <laughs> there was a student who was told by a school teacher that women couldn't be engineers and he'd eat her first contract if she ever successfully became one. Ten years later, she returned to the school with her contract and some salt and pepper. <laughs> and one woman described how she was walking down the street when a man working up on a roof started shouting comments and harassing her, so she stopped and tried to reason with him, asking him how he'd feel if someone was making sexually explicit comments about him in the street. Unfortunately, he didn't respond well and started shouting worse abuse. So she removed his ladder and walked on, leaving him. <laughs> As the project grew, so did its impact. The UK government started to use the stories we collected from real women to inform their actions on tackling workplace issues like the gender pay gap. Hundreds of schools and universities used the entries from young people to educate their students about healthy relationships and sexual consent. The United Nations held an event on everyday sexism in New York, recognising it for the first time, where activists from around the world met to exchange knowledge and strategies for tackling the problem. 
The British Transport Police used the entries from people on buses and trains to retrain 2,000 of their officers, resulting in a 50% rise in the reporting of sexual offences and a huge increase in perpetrators being brought to justice. And pressure from the project forced Facebook to change its policies on rape and domestic violence content, changing what was considered normal and acceptable for billions of users around the globe. When I look at the impact the project has had now, I feel proud to say that it has even slightly changed the world. But when I started out, I had no idea it could have that kind of effect. And if I had, I might have felt too overwhelmed and scared to begin. So the first secret I've learned along the way is this. The things that end up changing the world don't start out looking grand and enormous. They look small and local, perhaps even insignificant. A life-changing movement starts with a single idea. It begins with somebody who can't stop thinking about a particular problem. With a student who gets together with friends to brainstorm ideas. Or a teenager who speaks out about an issue they're passionate about. It means that you should never be put off taking action because you think the problem is too great or you're afraid of failing. And that's the second secret I've learned. There really isn't any such thing as failure. On my way to launching the project I run now, I failed over and over and over again. In 2012, I moved to London to work as an actress and started turning up to auditions for everything from IKEA adverts to Game of Thrones. Sometimes I'd be interrupted and stopped before I'd even managed to read the first sentence of the script. Sometimes I was unceremoniously told to take my top off. Sometimes I was rejected before I'd even auditioned because I wasn't a size zero. At the time, it felt like I was failing. Unable to make ends meet through acting, I took a job as a PA to a writer who was an agony aunt for a women's weekly magazine. It felt like I was going nowhere. But every step of that journey, steps which felt like failures at the time, provided me with a skill or a lesson that was vital to me in succeeding later on. If I hadn't spent so much time unsuccessfully auditioning, I would never have developed the public speaking skills and confidence I use now to speak out about the issues that matter me, to me, everywhere from schools and universities to the United Nations. If I hadn't worked for that agony aunt, I wouldn't have developed an understanding of the issues such as domestic abuse that impact on women's daily lives, an understanding which formed the basis of the project I later launched. And when I helped her with her columns and books, I couldn't possibly have known that the knowledge I gained about that industry would eventually help me when I started writing for The Guardian and The New York Times and publishing books of my own. The exact activities that felt like dead-end failures to me at the time were vital building blocks for success later on. Nobody avoids failure. It's completely normal and it isn't shameful. But how you pick yourself up and go on defines who you are. Don't forget that Dame Judi Dench was rejected over and over again before she finally got into drama school. Don't forget that J.K. Rowling submitted the manuscript for Harry Potter to 12 publishers who all rejected it before it was bought by a tiny publishing house for £1,500. Every experience we have adds up to who we are, so really nothing is a failure, it's just another step in the journey. Thomas Edison invented the electric light bulbs that are still used around the world today, but it took him over 10,000 attempts to invent one that worked and was commercially viable. After he'd made over 9,000 failed attempts, a newspaper reporter asked Edison if he felt like a failure and thought he should give up. He answered, why would I feel like a failure? And why would I ever give up? I now know definitively over 9,000 ways an electric light bulb will not work. <laughs> Success is almost in my grasp. And the third secret I've learned is that there is no single definition of success. As girls and as women, the world sometimes paints our success in funny ways. Very early on, when I was having my photograph taken for one of our biggest national newspapers, the picture editor rang up to say that we needed to discuss how to illustrate the article about sexism by making me look as sexy as possible. Sometimes we're told that success as a woman is dependent on looking a certain way, or making other people happy, or acting in a particular manner. We're still bombarded with stereotypes about how women should dress and behave, expected to see our bodies as problems to be solved, and accused of being bossy, shrill, or abrasive, where successful men are seen as powerful, strong, and ambitious. 
Our success is often diminished in the media or painted in comparison to men's. So remember the words of Simone Biles, the American gymnast who took a record-breaking five Olympic medals at the Rio Games and found herself constantly compared to male athletes by journalists. She said, I'm not the next Hussein Bolt or Michael Phelps. I'm the first Simone Biles. You're the only person who gets to define your success. It doesn't have to mean having it all or looking like a picture in a magazine or even getting to the very top of any particular ladder. Success is finding whatever it is that truly makes you happy. That might not happen immediately. It's okay to try lots of different things. It's okay not to know yet exactly where it is that you're going because the process of getting there might be the most interesting part. You don't have to have everything all planned out. And as far as I'm concerned, in the end, if you're happy, you've made it. So don't be afraid to take up space in the world, especially in areas dominated by men. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do something because of your sex. And do everything you can to help and support other women and girls, because our solidarity is our strength. I recently met a successful theatre producer who told me that one of her very earliest jobs when she was just trying to break into the industry was as a fairly low-level assistant on one of the Harry Potter films. In the very first meeting she attended, she sat at a table in a room full of men, and J.K. Rowling was sitting right next to her. Throughout that meeting, J.K. Rowling kept stopping to whisper in her ear or writing notes on a notepad and pushing them across the table to her, even about very insignificant things. After the meeting was over, she asked her why she'd done that. And J.K. Rowling said to her, I was the most important person in that room, and I wanted all those men to know that you were important too. So those are my three secrets. In the smallest ways and from the simplest beginnings, every one of us has the power to change the world. Don't ever be too afraid to try, because what feels like failure is just a stepping stone on your journey. And who knows what your personal success will look like. I can't tell you exactly what it is, nor can anybody else, and a women's magazine sure as hell can't, but you'll know it when you see it. So I'll leave you with a quote from American poet and civil rights activist Maya Angelou. Courage allows the successful woman to fail and learn powerful lessons from the failure, so that in the end, she didn't fail at all.